Trade Secrets is brought to you by Ruder Ware, business attorneys for business success, and by the Judd S. Alexander Foundation, supporting quality of life and economic development in Marathon County. Hi, I'm Stuart Etten, president of Ruder Ware Law Firm. Without businesses, communities would not thrive. And without communities, businesses wouldn't, well, have a place to do business. At Ruder Ware Law Firm, we've been providing counsel to Wisconsin business leaders and been a big part of our community for generations. So you could say we know a little bit about what it takes for the two to work together. That's why we're honored to present Trade Secrets here on Wisconsin Eye. It's a new series that shares candid conversations between successful Wisconsin business leaders and lets you, the audience, in on what it takes to cultivate both business and community in our great state. From Ruder Ware, thanks for watching and enjoy the show. One CEO travels to a company to meet another CEO and gets a tour. They talk business, challenges, share stories. Then the host CEO travels to another company, meets the new CEO, gets the tour. They talk business, challenges, share stories. Then we do it all over again. You get the picture. A chain of CEOs traveling around the state, meeting each other, talking business, sharing stories. That's Trade Secrets, CEO to CEO. Hi, I'm Dan Weinfurter and welcome to another episode of Wisconsin Eyes Trade Secrets, where we bring together Wisconsin business leaders to have candid conversations on what it takes to cultivate success in our businesses and in our communities. Our last episode focused on Peter Harkin of Harkin Inc., a manufacturer of sailing components. Think of America's Cup. Today, we're going to meet Catherine Gale of Gale Foods, Gale is the nation's largest aseptic dairy facility. Aseptic? More on that later. Recently, as part of a business panel, she outlined what business leaders must focus on to remain competitive in a global economy. A question I have for Catherine is, what is Gale Foods doing to remain competitive in the industry in which they participate? So one of the things that makes Trade Secrets so exciting and so innovative is that today we're going to have Peter Harkin join us for our conversation with Catherine. It'll be interesting to see how their respective business philosophies are similar and different. Okay, let's go find Peter and let's go find Catherine. But before we meet them, here's a little history on Gale Foods. When you first drive up to Gale Foods in Germantown, Wisconsin, it's difficult to fully appreciate its rich history. But the story of this business and the reasons for its success are stories of reinvention and innovation. In 1896, John P. Gale founded Gale Foods in a three-room building in Germantown with the goal to improve the quality of locally made butter. By 1917, he expanded to evaporated milk and built a new building which houses the company headquarters to this day. Home delivery became popular in the 50s and Gail Guernsey Farms delivered fresh dairy product to homes and restaurants throughout the region. In 1963, John P. Gale's son, also named John P. Gale, then 24 years old, joined the company at a time when the family business was losing money. He made the difficult decision to radically reduce the size of the company and, in essence, start over. In 1970, Gale took a gamble on a new style of food processing that allowed for the distribution of dairy products without the need for refrigeration. Aseptic food processing packages food in a sterile container where sterility is achieved by flash steam heating. The reinvention proved critical to Gale's growth and subsequent success. Today, Gale Foods generates over 250 million in yearly revenue and employs over 300 people in four separate facilities. Gale operates 11 production lines in over 800,000 square feet of space serving over 200,000 restaurant and food service customers. 
They also sell certain products at major retailers worldwide. In 2012, John retired after 50 years with the company and his daughter Catherine took over. Before taking the helm, Catherine earned advanced degrees in both education and business, went on to work at the Oracle Corporation, and also served the public sector in Chicago. Now, amidst an ever-changing business climate and as part of a growing food industry, it is Catherine's turn as CEO to reinvent Gale Foods once again. Dan? Catherine, great Welcome. to see you again. Morning, Catherine. Nice to meet you. Peter, nice right. to meet you. Yeah. Thank you right. for coming. Welcome to Gale Foods. We're thrilled to be here. So thanks for uh, being willing to participate in this. Absolutely. We're excited yeah. about it. Dan and I came for a breakfast of nachos and cheese. <laughs> I'm so good. <laughs> we have nachos and cheese, and we can also give you our Gale's Main Street uh, yogurt smoothies, which is our new mm. breakfast drink. We just introduced mm. it in Walmarts around the entire country. Mm. But you guys can have some for free. I think I'll go with the smoothie okay. as opposed to the cheese. I'll save that for lunch. <laughs> okay, you can have that too. I understand there's some garb we have to put yes, on Yes, so this we're a food manufacturing facility, so we follow what's known as good manufacturing practices and also for safety reasons. So you'll be wearing a full hairnet, earplugs, safety goggles, and a smock. And that's uh, what's necessary. You'll see everybody else out there will be in something similar, except I'll have a special uniform on for our employees. I do need a hairnet? You do need a hairnet. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'll take that as good news. OK. <laughs> in your case, we call it a head net. <laughs> Better. <laughs> you might need a beard net, though. Do you? Yeah. Did they tell you? I, I think I will okay. need that as well. Yes, need thank you. Well, so you get the full everything. Well, what do we have here? So here we have one of four plastic bottling lines that we have in our facility. As you can see, it's highly automated. You can see that we're running 400 bottles per minute with only two people that you can see. Very complicated process with a lot of different quality and safety parameters that we're monitoring throughout the process, both, you know, minute by minute, as well as over the weeks that we have control of the ingredients and the finished product. So, Catherine, tell us a little bit about what goes on here. I know this is what's called aseptic manufacturing, but for most folks, including myself, we're not quite sure what that is. So. Got it. So, at Gale Foods, we make dairy products that are shelf stable and that's what low acid that's what low acid aseptic is so what we're saying is if you go to a grocery store right now and you buy a milk product if you bring it home you have to put it in your refrigerator right it's otherwise it idea, would spoil yes. Yes, it's a good idea okay but if you buy a Gale Foods product our products can be on your regular shelf next to the dry goods until you open them so what we have done is taken dairy products and made them safe to, to be on your shelf so that they won't spoil until you open them and are ready to use them. So how does that process work in, a, in sort of layman's so terms? What spoils product is bacteria. And so what we do is make sure that our products are commercially sterile. That means they have no bacteria in them. And so then there's nothing to spoil. here is impressive because you see physically the automation. What you can't see, which is perhaps even more impressive, is the way that we deal with the food safety of the product and the way that we process the product to make it both safe and of great quality. So that's invisible to your eyes and that's the real heart of what we deliver. So logistically, you can duplicate that. But putting the pieces together in a way that delivers food safety and quality in addition to the logistics is the real key to our success and what we offer to the people that choose to buy their products from us. You spent some time here early in your career at, at Gale Foods, and then you went to the right. large corporate world and then into the political arena. And so I'm curious, how did that decision 
impact how you view your world today? Well, I wouldn't say that those decisions were at the time made uh, with a great deal of strategic thought, as in I will spend this amount of time in the not-for-profit sector, this in government, this in for-profit business. But it turned out to have greatly influenced my narrative, my own personal narrative about how things work, and I'm so happy I have those experiences. So basically what I'm saying is for America to work, it takes both government functioning well and private enterprise functioning well. And so it's been phenomenal for me to have an opportunity to work on both sides of that equation and really understand where I think the challenges are in both of those um, structures today. Maybe a, a bit from you on how your early time impacted your view of the, the corporate world and the company that you ended up building. I don't think anything was really planned, you know. It, I think basically I learned the so-called real life or after university life corporate world, whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, kind of the hard way, you know, out in the field. So what was the reception of the employee group when it was announced that you would be coming back full time in, in a role of running the business? Well, so I'd been here for quite a number of years before I became president and CEO, and I became president and CEO before my brother left and before my father retired. It's definitely been an enormous transition. It just so happens that that transition coincided with several other transitions, of which I'd really mentioned three. One is we're changing from a traditional manufacturing company to what we call a world-class manufacturing company. So that entails entirely different ways of working, requires different efforts from the employees, different way of communicating, and delivers different results. And then we're also changing what's a very well-known transition of an entrepreneurially led company to a professionally managed company. So we used to be a reasonably small company. Let's say we're 70 million years ago and now we're 250 million. So you can't run a company like that the same way. So whether or not I was taking over or someone else, the company was in a phase of needing to transition from an entrepreneurially led company to professionally led. We also are in the midst of an external transformation in our marketplace. It's a much more highly competitive environment with a lot of players entering the marketplace. So the pace of change and the requirements of the marketplace are much more demanding than they were before. So if you take those three transitions and realize that they're all happening at the same time as I happen to be taking over the company, that's a lot of change for one company to absorb. If we don't make all those changes, then we won't be successful. It's interesting because this theme of reinvention and innovation was a big part of the success of Harkin as well, but in a completely different business, yet some common themes between both of your businesses. That's, it's totally, you know, when I was listening to Catherine, I was thinking, my God, we went exactly through the same process and change, and it is, uh, change is, difficult for a lot of people you know they they get comfortable in their in their place and in their nest the company has to change it has no no choice you know especially if you're going to do it here in the United States so you got to do it differently if you're going to take on the world and be competitive and and you can you can just uh, you got to do what Catherine says you go through these processes and it takes time and patience and uh, you just keep plugging away. Try to create a culture where the people understand that in order to progress, we, we do have to change. You gotta provide the tools that will help them to enjoy the change and, and go with it. We're not cutting your job. We might be cutting that process, what you're doing, simplifying it and automating it, but we want you to use your brains and your talents into something more skilled and higher, more interesting, and moving them on. So that's a way you can grow the company without increasing a lot of labor and uh, those kind of costs. We've had to spend time educating people about why the change matters and why without change, not just now, but in the future, we're not going to be successful. And so we think it's that there's some accountability on the business 
leadership to actually make a case for the change to the people who work here. So it's not just change for change sakes or change because I feel like it, because I want to run it differently than my father or something. It's change because that's what the marketplace demands for us all to still be here and to grow the company. And like Catherine said before, it's a fast changing world right now. And we either run with it, you know, and sure we stumble once in a while, but uh, boy, you can't stop and you can't just say, no, we're gonna keep doing it the way we were. And you will get run over, that's all there's to it. We do a lot of the uh, designing of the system in the house or what, or do you no. have to go to a firm, outside firm and say, right. okay, this is, this is what we got to do. Right. Uh, so here's the thing. So over the years, that's one of the key advantages that John Gale, my father, brought to this uh, business. He was an engineer at heart and he designed a lot of the systems with the support of some excellent employees who worked here. I referred earlier to the expanded pace of change in our industry. So now we have both internal resources and external resources when we design a new line. It's no longer possible for a company of our size to have internal resources that can stay up to speed with everything that's happening in the industry and produce a state-of-the-art line. Part of our advantage was this investment in automation. We're, def we're a highly automated facility, even as compared to some competition. So obviously in the long run, talent makes a huge difference, maybe the most important difference for any business. How do you think about talent? I think there's two things that contribute to the results that you get in your business from the talent. One is the talent that people actually bring to the table. And that, then we need to talk about workforce development and what's available in Wisconsin and today's skills, et cetera. But then the second thing is, what's the culture that you have at your company that that talent works within? And do you have something at your company that brings out and supports in people really the best that they have to give? Well, we attract talent with dogs. With what? Dogs. <laughs> we have dogs in the plant. <laughs> we allow people to bring their dogs. <laughs> oh, not in the food like manufacturing that. company. And I think that they would have a ball in here. No, I don't <laughs> I think that would work sure. so well here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think they'd stay by their masters or, you know, the test. They'd, oh, be, wow. they'd be having a ball in there. So, uh, but that's just on the side. Um, we try to create an atmosphere where they, they want to come here, you know, and uh, so on. Our biggest problem in talent is probably in the skills area of machining. And uh, so the, the hardest thing is, I think Wisconsin is lacking uh, in talent in these areas and it's wide open. All of our businesses, I think we could line up as many CEOs as you wanted here and everybody would say that we need more talent coming in the door. And for that's an opportunity for states, communities, even for America overall, to look at workforce development and what kind of skills people are coming out of various levels of education with in order to have the opportunity to contribute at these companies. It's like our technical school in Pewaukee. They have almost more college graduates learning a skill, a redundant, you know, the redundant education, so they can go out and get a job because what they got out of college isn't cutting it. We want in America people who are driven to go to college, to have the opportunity to go to college. There's no question about that. Having sure. said, I absolutely agree that that is not the only path to a successful career. In fact, as Peter said, there may be more opportunity choosing a technical college, choosing a skill-based education, and that's what we would like to see. When we're trying to hire, we're not hurting for our college graduate jobs. We're hurting for the jobs that need a technical skill. Sometimes it seems almost as a country that we're uncomfortable saying that a technical degree and education is as good as college. And I want to put forth that 
they're equally good depending on what that person wants to do with their life and that they're equally valuable to society and we shouldn't act as if one is an A kind of a choice and the other one is a second choice. I think it's a mistake and it hurts what we're hearing. It hurts Peter's business, it hurts our business and what that means is then it's hurting the opportunities of people who are out there perhaps thinking they need to choose one thing when they're really more suited and would be happier choosing another career path. Catherine's totally right with this A and B kind of thing. And in our company, uh, you know, we, we don't stop their learning. If, if they come from a technical school and they want to go further and go to college, get the kind of, we push that, we just keep going. You can, you can do it at a technical school, you can go ahead and get a degree or go to college, allow them to go at night school and we help pay for that. So now we're at another line and you can see that it looks to your eyes very different from the line we saw before which was the bottling line. But they're really all very similar. Every line we have, we have to deliver a sterile product. So in this case it's cheese sauce. So we have to make the cheese sauce and sterilize it. And then we have to deliver a sterile package. So we, in this case, it's film, and we sterilize it with hydrogen peroxide. And then we have to fill the product into the package in a controlled sterile environment, and that's what happens here. So all of the lines that you see have the same design principles. There's over a million servings of nachos and cheese per day, per day. around the country that from, our, from our facility. It's a very large, high volume facility, and that's what it's designed to do and what we do well. This is one of our quality labs. So as you might imagine, of course, in your business as well, quality is very important. In our business, it's the quality of the food. And so we have labs throughout our facilities testing for different things. The one we're in right now, we do most of our testing for the batches that are in progress. So we'll test for pH, for solids, viscosity, um, different quality parameters, protein. We also do a sensory. So I'll give you a little opportunity to do that, okay? And I know you're going to love it, so one for you. That looks suspiciously like cheese. It is, it is some fabulous cheese sauce, best with nachos, but um, in the lab, we do it straight. Got a little bite to it, is it chili or something? Or what is it? Yes, there's The problem is, is that then I just wanna keep going and get my nachos out. Yeah, that's pretty darn good. Yeah, it is. Okay, so there are people who get to have this job and actually taste these products throughout the day. This is one of our protein drinks, and we make these products, there you are, there you are. We make these products for some global multinational brands. We're a contract manufacturer. We also make these products for large grocery stores where we make their private label. Skull. It's very, very good. And good well, for you? Any, I mean, anything. Yes, absolutely. Anything chocolate. Jeez. I'm very passionate about what I would call the state of the American, the great American experiment, which is to say our democracy, capitalism, what was created in America. America doesn't keep going the way America's been going and keep creating this possibility for people without highly competitive businesses. So this isn't just for me about making Gale Food successful. This is about contributing to what America is, both for ourselves but what we've been in the world. It's a, it's a big emotional uh, calling for me for people to run successful businesses. <coughs> Because when we don't have successful businesses, then we don't have prosperity, and then we can't create any of the opportunities that we want for people. You know, in our case, it was, uh, we're immigrants, my brother and I, and came out of Second World War, you know, and 
And it was American uh, soldiers and paratroopers that rescued my father and us and all that kind of stuff. So my brother and I decided quite some time ago we wanted to pay back. So we decided that uh, when we were going to get into our own business or make stuff, uh, that we were going to make the best in the world. And made in USA and the world was going to know that this was better than anybody else's. So not, not for me, I might sound melodramatic, but for the country and, you know, for the U.S., made in the U.S. And we see American manufacturing coming back from Asia and so on, because by God, you know, we can do it here. You know, and I'm inspired by that. I'm inspired by what Peter says about why he has his company and why he's proud of Made in the USA. We shouldn't feel as business people, any business people, that it's melodramatic to say that we do some of what we do for reasons of patriotic pride or to create opportunity in our country or for what we believe is possible in the world. I think it's just a disservice to suggest that we're all running businesses only for the bottom line. Life's too short for it to be about that, and I think for a lot of people it's not about that, and yet they do sometimes feel like that's not what they're going to discuss as their main motivation. And yet I think it's out there, and it's what, it's what I find truly inspiring. Well, that was truly fascinating. Despite the fact that Peter and Catherine operate two businesses that are in two completely different industries, it is amazing at the number of things that they have in common. Certainly, their view on the importance of culture and on the importance of people. Join us again when Catherine and I meet another CEO on the next episode of Trade Secrets. Have a great day. Trade Secrets has been brought to you by the law firm of Ruder Ware and by the Judd S. Alexander Foundation.